And now I hand over to Moritz, um, who, as usual, will give you an overview of the last meeting and introduce you to the speakers. Moritz, please. Ja, danke, Julia. Ähm, ich werde gleich die äh, Freiheit der Sprache in Anspruch nehmen und hier auf Deutsch äh, referieren. Wir haben heute Kompromiss, dass wir äh, eben die Folien hier auf Englisch haben, also sollte für jeden was dabei sein. Genau, die Agenda hatte Julia schon vorgestellt. Ähm, wir hatten das letzte Mal das Thema im November, äh, da ging es um Ingenieurbau. Ähm, da hatten wir drei Firmen, äh, zwei Firmen eingeladen, einmal Forscher vom Cluster und zwar ging es um eine Softwarefirma Motogen mit dem Thema effizientes Engineering im Holzbau. Dann hatten wir Structure mit dabei, ein Planungsbüro. Eigentlich war das so eine Schnittstelle zwischen Forschung und Praxis, weil sie auch mit dem Cluster sehr verwandt, vertraut sind. Auf der anderen Seite aber eben ein Planungsbüro, ein Tragwerksplaner sind. Ähm, und als letzten Punkt hatten wir dann eben den Exzellenzcluster mit der Buga Wood Pavilion und äh, der Vortrag war dann entsprechend auch auf Englisch. Am Schluss will ich dann noch einen kleinen Ausblick geben, aber zunächst mal einen kleinen Rückblick, auch für alle diejenigen, die halt eben letztes Mal nicht dabei sein konnten. So, ähm, zum Modogen. Also Modogen, ich habe es gesagt, ist ein Startup aus der Softwareindustrie, die machen im Endeffekt... Ähm, ja, im Holzbau, äh, vielleicht die, die Motivation von Modegen kann man hier auf der Folie ganz gut erkennen. Ähm, die haben aber gesagt, äh, beim Holzbau, Massivbau, Stahlbeton ist eben äh, ein Stück weit auch das Problem der ökonomischen Konditionierung. Das heißt, das Gewohnte ist halt eben der Massivbau. Ähm, die ganzen Werkzeuge, die ähm, dafür bereitstehen, sind für den Massivbau optimiert. Und das war letztlich so ein bisschen der, der ausschlaggebende Punkt, warum sie gesagt, dass sie gesagt haben, okay, um da diese Konditionierung Richtung Holzbau ein bisschen äh, zu pushen, äh, wollen sie da selber aktiv werden und eben mit diesem Werkzeug an den Markt gehen, der einfach den Holzbau dann ähm, auch besser unterstützen kann. Ähm, es ist im Endeffekt eine Plattform, ähm, sie machen Statik, ähm, aber eben nicht nur Statik, sondern es ist auch eine Plattform, wo man ähm, ja, BIM-Modelle sozusagen einlesen kann, das physische Modell ganz allgemein wird, wird da importiert und dann umgewandelt in ein Analysemodell. Und ähm, das heißt, es ist auch auf der einen Seite eine Plattform zu dem Modellsharing, auf der anderen Seite findet dann eben auch statische Berechnungen statt. Und die Idee ist, dass die Schnittstellen sehr offen gehalten sind und dass sich da auch andere Anbieter dann letztlich zumindest perspektivisch da auch auf andocken können. Und äh, genau, sie wollen sozusagen den Holzbau mit der Software unterstützen. Das war der erste Part. Dann kommen wir jetzt zu dem äh, zweiten Teil. Ähm, auch sehr interessant. Und zwar ist das hier ein ähm, Gebäude. Also wir hatten erstmal eine allgemeine Vorstellung von dem Tragwerksplanungsbüro. Wir ähm, hatten da den Dr. Timo Klaus, der jetzt auch relativ neu beim Structure angefangen hat, gerade für den Holzbau. Weil auch bei Structure hat sich gezeigt, dass immer mehr Anfragen in dem Bereich kommen. Und ähm, von, dem, von der Seite hatten wir auch das Glück, dass wir da gleich ähm, mit dem neuen Personal sozusagen arbeiten konnten. Ähm, es wurden halt allgemein die Projekte vorgestellt. Ähm, Structure hat ja viel mit äh, Spezial-Sonderlösungen äh, zu tun und ist, sagen wir mal, auch, auch sehr fortschrittlich aus meiner Perspektive unterwegs. Ähm, jetzt ein ganz aktuelles Projekt war halt eben ein Fachwerk, wo ähm, daher auch der Titel, wie viel Stahl braucht der Holzbau, und traditionelles Weitergedacht, wo einfach der Versuch unternommen worden ist, dass man auf der einen Seite einen Rückgriff auf äh, traditionelle Zimmermannsverbindungen macht, auf der anderen Seite aber eben äh, damit auch in die Zukunft geht. Und ähm, das ist, denke ich, an dem Beispiel ganz gut gelungen, weil wir können sehen auf dem Bild, dass ähm, wir sozusagen zentrische Quoten haben. Das heißt, wir haben ja keine Exzentrizitäten. Und das heißt, von der statischen Seite ist es ein ideales Fachwerk äh, einerseits, auf der anderen Seite habe ich hier halt eben reine Holzverbindung und kann mir halt die metallischen Verbindungsmittel sparen und von daher eigentlich aus beiden Welten so das Beste übernommen und aus, ja, daher, von daher auch ein innovatives Projekt aus meiner Sicht. Dann war als dritter Teil eben jetzt vom Cluster, wir haben ja in der Agenda gesehen, dieses Mal haben wir zwei aus der Forschung, damals hatten wir zwei aus der Praxis, das heißt, es gleicht sich alles irgendwo dann wieder aus. Und da ging es um den ja mittlerweile auch schon bekannten äh, buga wood -Pav pavillon Hier jetzt aber ein bisschen mehr aus der Perspektive der Tragwerksplanung. 
Und ähm, genau, das hatte eben Simon Bechert vorgestellt, der auch am ähm, IDKE Teil vom Exzellenzcluster ist und ähm, auch relativ vor kurzem, da habe ich hier einen Link drauf gemacht und ähm, dem Science Direct ein neues Paper veröffentlicht worden ist. Ähm, wo dann nochmal detailliert einfach auf ähm, die verschiedenen Aspekte vom Ugawood äh, Pavillon eingegangen äh, gegangen worden ist. Ähm, es ist im Endeffekt es ist es ein Beispiel von den ganzen weit gespannten Systemen. Also es gibt sozusagen diese zwei Linien ja am Exzellenzcluster im Holzbau. Das einmal ähm, ja das was man immer so unter den Pavillons eigentlich ähm, kennengelernt hat, die weit, weit gespannten Systeme und auf der anderen Seite eben die den mehrgeschossigen Holzbau, der auch immer von den Rückfragen her ähm, eigentlich mehr, 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 mehr nachgefragt wird und der ist jetzt ähm, verstärkt auch mehr im Fokus. Da werden dann sicher auch die nächsten Demonstratoren weiter in die Richtung gehen. Ja, und am Schluss hatten wir noch eine ganz angeregte Diskussion. Wir hatten da Unterstützung auch von Herrn Julian, äh, von, von Julian Lienhardt direkt. Und da ging es um die unterschiedlichen Fragen, also natürlich um die Vorträge in erster Linie, ähm, aber auch um allgemeine Fragen, also den, den ökologischen sozialen Ausgleich. Ähm, was auch immer ein Thema war, war so die Standardisierung. Auf der einen Seite ist eben die ähm, Individualisierung immer mehr möglich durch den robotischen Einsatz. Ähm, auf der anderen Seite ist natürlich auch immer die Frage, ähm, inwieweit kann man Dinge standardisieren? Das waren so zwei, zwei Gegenpole. Ähm, ja, es sind einfach nur ein paar Stichworte und äh, letztlich ähm, der Stein der Weisen wurde hier auch noch nicht gefunden, aber wir waren zum Teil dicht dran und ähm, genau, das war im Endeffekt der Vortrag. Damit haben wir jetzt im Prinzip ähm, so diesen Bereich Architektur mit heute. Ich gehe nochmal zurück. Wir hatten am allererst, das allererste Mal haben wir uns Pro um Produktionsprozesse unterhalten. Dann gab es eben das Event, was ich jetzt eben kurz vorgestellt hatte, äh, zum Engineering und heute geht es eben um die Architektur, sodass wir hier einfach auch versuchen, die verschiedenen Aspekte mit, mit abzudecken und ähm, alles, was am Exzellenzcluster relevant ist, auch hier entsprechend darzustellen. Ja, wie geht es weiter? Ähm, wir werden auf jeden Fall ähm, nach den Treffen auch äh, verstärkt auf die einzelnen ähm, ja, Kollegen aus dem Netzwerk zurückkommen und äh, zur Profilschärfung. Wir werden sind natürlich immer offen, wenn von Ihrer Seite äh, was kommt, äh, was, was für Themen relevant sind. Vielleicht zum Abschluss hier noch eine kleine, ähm, ja, ein bisschen, bisschen Werbung. Und zwar, ähm, es gibt aktuell für, den, für ein Massivholzprojekt in der Forschung ähm, oder im Stichwort AP15, also einem assoziierten Projekt, wo auch Firmen beteiligt sind, ähm, hatten wir kürzlich jetzt eine Materialspende, eine Zusage bekommen und die ist dann voraussichtlich auch im, ähm, ja, in der KB15, äh, kommt dann die Lieferung, das nur am Rande. Also wenn jemand hier ähm, auch noch was spenden möchte, sind wir gerne offen, und, äh, aber damit soll es dann das auch gewesen sein. Und ich würde jetzt gerne zu unserem Hauptteil übergeben. Our next candidate is Alia Rappaport. Now we switch back uh, to, to English and uh, Alia is an architect. Um, Exhibitor, designer, and a PhD researcher at the University um, for Architectural History, uh, in short, IFAC, um, at the University in Stuttgart. She holds a master degree in media architecture from the Bauhaus University in Weimar and has over six years of experience uh, in various small, small and um, medium scale architecture projects across Europe and the USA. Her current focus um, within the cluster of excellence in CDC um, is on historical lineage of experimental architecture and the past vision for technology enabled co design building environments. So we are happy to have you here, Alia, and um, the stage is yours, I would say. Thank you so much, Moritz. I hope you can hear me well. Just, um... Wait a second until I will share my screen. Okay, good. So, uh, I'm to be full screen mode. My topic today is historical precedence of modular prefabricated multi-story projects in the 60s and 70s. As Mara said, my name is Alia Rappaport. And I'm part of the Cluster of Excellence in CDC and working at the Institute for Architectural History. 
uh, as an introduction for agenda today, and then to introduce what are we doing in the Cluster of Excellence in our research project, RB10. Then I'm going to give a small background about industrially produced architecture in the 60s and 70s, going on to Matt Hansen innovations in competitions, and general observations and lessons for the future. This is our team. For the research project 10, we have three professors. It's Professor Ahim Menges, my professor Klaus Jan Philipp, and Cordula Klopp. And Hannah and I are working together in a team of five researchers, doctoral and postdoctoral researchers, um, all looking at the novel features of computational architecture and the related reconfiguration of human machine relations as well as functions, competencies, and service provisions in design and construction. What is important to say that our research project is the only non-technical project out of the all 20 projects that are now in the first phase. And we're looking at the uh, co-design from three non-technical perspectives from the architectural, architectural history and social sciences. So the IFAC, it is short for Institute for Architectural History, we're looking at the point of integrative design ideas, models, simulations, and methods, which were inherent in the past projects of the 60s and 70s, that is approximately half a century ago, and what kind of new thinking in architecture and beyond were made possible after these projects manifested or not. So uh, a bit for the background of the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, in this uh, time, new materials uh, started to emerge with utopian vision of technological reordering of built environment. As a change from metal, metal panel system of the 40s uh, came precast and pre-stress concrete of the late 50s, and it was such a big trend. For example, here you can see on the right picture, the advertisements in, in progressive architecture are beautiful. The world of reinforced concrete, it's fast to first week. Uh, yes, as a result, concrete panels were a go-to tool for the state housing initiatives, as well as everywhere, but especially also in Germany. Modules and capsules emerge as efficient elements for optimization and production and culminated in the megastructures and metabolism movement, as here in the Nagakin capsule tower from Kurokawa in Japan. And generally, uh, the structures was more about the concrete, pressurized concrete, and steel. But also what happened in the 60s, 70s, the introduction of the computation or the early computation to the architecture and rethinking the ways how we design and how we build. Uh, from the rethinking the general architectural problems, as here on the left side, Christopher Alexander's pattern language, firstly uh, used for urban design problems, but now widely also used uh, even in the user experience design and in the, in the computation. But also the radical movement of the new younger gener uh, generations of the architects, which are in the 60s and 70s, uh, stood up and said, we don't want this generalization or generic uh, architecture that is everywhere is going to be the same. So uh, offices like Archizome, like Archigram, and Farm, and so on, they created their own landscapes or ideas of how new architecture can look like. Here on the right side is the drawings of Archizome in Domus in 1971. So what IFAC is looking at in all this context, we're looking at um, how flexible or partially adaptable buildings were and their systems. We're looking at the groundbreaking, groundbreaking innovations and architecture without architects and introduction of the CED and machines in design. And also we're looking at the experimental innovations in lightweight constructions, asking 
consequentially how adaptable were building systems back then, were they designed to be inherently flexible, which materials were used and why, what were the main goals for optimization, was it purely economic or political uh, or economical, which were new design and science ideals, which were realized or which were not, and what technologies were used in design and construction. Then we also look specifically at which forms could be produced by scientific methods of design and to which extent computation was utilized for design and construction of such forms. All of that is our his historical precursors of co-design. Our methods is critical historical investigation of the literature and survey of the past projects. So the historical investigation of the literature will look in widely at the concepts of optimization, automation, innovation, and different integrative models, all of these and beyond hashtags for what we look at. But also we're looking at the past projects. As examples that I'm going to show you now, it's the uh, precedents of the experimental architecture, more about the laboratories, production spaces, and offices as a multi-story buildings. Not all of them, or actually none of them, are timber buildings, because timber was just generally not in trend there uh, back in the 60s and 70s, and only partly used in the very one-off projects. So in the precedence analysis that we did at the very beginning of our uh, part of the working package, we looked at the different laboratories and experimentation spaces. And we looked about how the form-based analysis, the ordering system of the designs were um, fulfilled, at their program, at the flexibility of the program. And uh, we cross-checked that with other projects and based it on the diagram of how standardized or how individualized the projects were and the level of tradition of the uh, used techniques and methods to the level of innovation in ideas, design, and implementation. What we saw that only very few actually used both innovation and individualization. Actually, in our case, it was only ELIC, uh, Institute for Lightweight Structures in Stuttgart, most of them, even the innovative projects, back in that time, they were still using very standardized, very modular approach and ideas of how the future cities, future architecture could look like. The more individualized projects were generally more traditionally designed, built, and had the more rectangular or homo uh, homogenic appearance. From the initial findings of the looking at the precedents, we saw, as I said, the higher degree of standardization and modularity. Uh, there was innovation and digitalization, but rather through unconventional space, spatial arrangements, uh, which in turn motivated to use conventional elements in a novel way. Something which may come to the mind is the Jugad version of India, where you have the conventional elements and you're creating something new. Uh, then design is still being made analog. Computer-based tools are used very sparingly, if ever, due to the restriction of the computer-based tools. Greater human centricity of the design, first book, post occupancy post analysis attempts, prevalent modularity of building systems is generally as generic flexibility, not the individual flexibility, which has rarely been used by the future users. For example, in Salk Institute, the opportunity to move the partitions and walls in between the labs were never used from the very beginning of the project up until now. And then lastly, degree of experimentation and heterogeneous forms directly related to availability of budget. The more standardized, the more uh, rollout uh, project it is, the more uh, copies of this project has to be, the less budget is available and the more modular is going to happen at the end. 
what also have uh, emerged in this time is the movement of uh, adaptable architecture. Adaptability, we can perceive this notion as a tool to address discrepancy between aging of materials, aging, and building robustness. This movement from the mid 50s uh, were about the adaptability of buildings to the requirements of the people for the time being. This is where prefabricated building elements introduced initially, even earlier, by Fuller and Waxman and elaborated in. Uh, in the 40s, elaborated by Friedman, Schulze, Phillips in the 50s, and catching on by the radical architects in the 60s, came to nourish. Instant architecture, plug in, clip on, skeleton infrastructure, jug desert on, suspended structures, inflatable envelopes, model architecture, all of that found their space in the adaptable architecture movement. Here, for example, on the right side, you can see the plug in city sketch by Peter Cook from the 1963. And on the lower picture, you see the parts of these of which this uh, modular city is built of. Here, interchangeable modular parts means interchangeable and modular city. Uh, that in their Archicam, we also expanded in the plug in universities and uh, computer cities and so forth. At the same time, in 1974, at the ground of ELEC, uh, there was a conference called Adaptable Architecture and Passungsfähigbauen, directed by Fry Otto, where lots of uh, very famous at that time, and uh, architects, engineers, and uh, other experts talk. We saw their statements by Konradi, Jodike, Friedman, Waxman, Otto, Hilbes, Fasch, and others. Generally, they asked uh, how can build environments be better adapted to the needs and interests of inhabitants, uh, more humane and holistic approach to environments, in a way that flexible adaptivity can also lead to general anonymity in buildings that do not match the requirements of the users. Here, uh, on the right side, a picture of uh, Habitat 67 by Moshe Safdi, which was criticized as not uh, adaptable enough uh, because of the seemingly appearing modular uh, item. Uh, yeah, it, individual modules that could not be actually moved or expanded on. So uh, in this colloquium, they talked about adaptable living units consider that were considered more costly than static ones. So flexibility for the future would be the luxury that not everybody could actually afford. But also, on the other hand, it can be sold as a quality feature or investment in the future. Uh, when we talk about flexibility, it goes beyond also the material aspect. It goes in a way how we design the buildings, which will can be expanded, can be demolished, can be adapted to the needs of the future. Uh, how Germany approached that uh, in the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, there was a state funded competitions for the modular prefabricated um, mass housing. Uh, it uh, was um, brought up by the uh, government in the air in the right in a row of three competitions. These I took the Two um, tables from Architectur Wettbewerbe, Architectural Competition Edition, are looking at the different building methods and building systems. And in the way already back then, analyzing the difference between traditional building, rational building, prefabricated building, and industrial building, and how it can be useful for one or another. Uh, competition or use or yeah, generally used to uh, get one of the systems 
uh, as a system of choice. So the first competition that was in 1972, it was FWG or a flexible von Kranktest. Idea of all the competitions that uh, in the similar to what Hanopa explained us before in how Werner Sobek AG is working together with Walter Müller, all of these competitions were had to be RG. That means that architects and uh, engineers and the instructors had to work together and submit their proposal together. And in a way, uh, they promise that it has to be done and exactly in the same compilation. So the first one, if it uh, FWG, flexible von in 1972, uh, initiated by the German Ministry of Town and Country Planning to design and build flexible, adaptable dwellings. Um, flexible residential ground plans have to uh, incorporate four-person dwellings up to 85 square meters and five-person dwellings up to 95 square meters. Interestingly, most entries decided for square plan and cost and efficiency had to be approached by serial production and industrially produced elements. Uh, the second competition, which was in also 1972, was called Elementa. Uh, where the task was to use the catalog of already existing prefabricated building systems so it will be feasible and uh, useful to ready to build elements in a way of DIY projects that everybody can do from whatever is available on the market. The dwellings uh, have to range between 40 and 95 square meters and incorporate one to five people. Uh, Plans, a uh, system used here were reinforced concrete panels, long span reinforced concrete skeleton, cellar spaces, uh, reinforced concrete, reinforced concrete frames with T beams. For example, here in the design from Steidle, uh, partnering with Hinter Hinteregger in Nuremberg. Um, another competition or another submission for this competition was. Sites with Neue Heimat in Hannover, uh, which is rather uh, widespread among, yeah, Neue Heimat is very famous. So um, this competition was more in demand compared, uh, or the ideas were more in demand compared to the typical buildings in the same area because of the valid freedom of adaptability over the predefined floor plans. You can see that here in exactly the same floor plan, you can decide however you want to have your own uh, interior design. So uh, generally speaking, here on the right side, the building system allowed for almost infinite amount of floor plans um, variations. The third one is a year after, it's Integra. For Integra building systems, needed to be adapted for the central area of the inner city and period adaptive to change your using requirements instead of monofunctional. For example, in the uh, lower, uh, in the first two floors, there would be a shop and then there is going to be offices and on the top is going to be a housing, but everything could be interchangeable and adapted to the actual uh, need of the users. Um, housing should be at least 50% of the floor area um, and that also need to support construction and sections and expandability over time, asking from the very beginning that uh, the whole building has to be done in stages as, little as much as money is there and as much as the demand is there, as well as DIY, DIY fabrication and maintenance. So here on the right side, you can see that the diagram of the factors and feature profiles of the Office Müller uh, for submission in Verda, uh, where they're looking at the uh, building systems, how it is connected to RAM organization, to variants of design of actually the useful area and so on. One of the projects that uh, um, came out of Integrate was widespread as uh, 
Metastadt uh, by Richard Dritrich together with uh, Okal, exactly with the same idea of the prefabricated, rebuildable and expandable city. Um, initially, Metastadt was system was even planned in different um, uh, materials. It could have been done in Tiber, but uh, finally the steel lobby went through, so it was in steel. Uh, Metastadt, uh, from the very beginning already, it was very um, yeah hard to imagine that that could actually be what uh, the whole idea is about. It was planned for to be a, city, a tiny city, a meta city for 50,000 people, which at that time already was just too much. Um, the progress of time uh, didn't support the robustness of the system. So at the end, at the end of the 80s, 1987, uh, 1988, the estimated uh, amount of money for the renovation would be more than 10 million Deutsche Mark, which would be even more um, than just demolishing every, every uh, piece of Metastadt. Also, uh, the demand for the flexibility in the system was not met with actually uh, demand of the users. They didn't use it that much. So in the 1988, it was demolished and still stands as one of the, maybe not a very uh, successful experiment, but an experiment in the modular and expandable prefabricated city. So general observations of these is uh, overall, if there's time for mass housing for uh, multi-story buildings, there is functional dictionary. Everything has to grow, change, but also adapt uh, with so the aging and be compatible with different systems. Reliability and flexibility were often as an E, but not actually met in the design and the implementation. Very often it was technocratic form of planning that the predictability, clarity, Manipulation and calculation were actually defining the final implementation of the design and how generic layout is going to be. As a result, the uh, 60s series were the end of the first uh, wave of the system thinking of cybernetics and the second order. So some approaches actually tackle the evolutionary ecosystems uh but not really met or implemented widely back then generally it was standardized length and regular geometrical patterns and grid instead of actually allowing for irregular or heterogeneic patterns and the new tools first uh for example with the calculations and using computer in the um Estimating the costs, they were uh, used for new production technologies as integrated part of the design process of building systems. As Conrad Waxman also told, or a quote of him, toolmaker is a new craftsman. What we can also uh, see that back in that time, new materials emerged such as PVC membrane and fiber uh, in a way of trying to get away from uniformity and ugliness of program frame buildings to more aesthetical beauty at less expense by means of prefabrication and machine utilization. Smaller mass of the building would facilitate rebuilding or mobility. Already back then, we were to talking or thinking about the rapid changes of building environments, adapting as reacting to terminal reconstruction. Timber just started to emerge in a way of the uh, ecological architecture and timber and clay 
who perceives as cheaper and more flexible material alternatives to the widespread and sudden concrete or reinforced concrete. However, up until 80s, there were not enough projects being done in that or not enough knowledge of working with these projects. Um, and we see that cooperation and permeability of methods between various fields were uh, observed as well. For example, as mathematicians, geodesists, engineers, architects, and town planners all working together at the same table. So finally, the quote that I wanted to say by um, Jürgen Jodicke for this slide, uh, it's in German. I decided not to translate it in English because I want to give it original. Erst gelegte und nicht änderbare Architektur kann eine rasche Veralterung der Gebäude zur Folge haben. Da eine Anpassung an veränderte Erwartungen und Bedürfnisse und an neue technologische Entwicklungen nicht möglich ist. One of the uh, participants of the adaptable architecture uh, and passing stage power in Colloquium in 1974 was Wolf Hilbert. This was his suggestion or his uh, scenario for the future. What will happen in the 50 years from the 1970 to 2020? A uh, prefabricated house has been and continues to be not only a reflection of the house as a replicable object of design, but also a critical agent in the discourse of sustainability, architectural invention, new material and formal research. So what can we learn for the future? Looking at this scenario, are our 2020 building systems producing actually variety and diversity? Do we follow alternative strategies for nature in our lifestyle? Are our theory, theories more, more biocentric? Do we achieve environmental intelligence and decision making in our structures? Which technologies do we use? With that, uh, I'm giving word to Hannah. And thank you so much. Uh, maybe Hannah can give us an insight if 2020 buildings is what they thought it's going to be. Okay, th thank you, Hannah and Alia again. And um, maybe now we can come to the uh, question. Are there any question now directly? We get some hand clapping. If not, I may start uh, with uh, one question. Maybe I start with um, Hannah, if it's okay. Um, so, I mean, I find it very interesting now the the last slices you showed and the direction that uh, the research goes in this. Um, yeah, that we are get uh, become more more um, flexible also for for timber slabs, for example. And um, is there an idea? Um, I mean, at the moment, um, uh, the concrete and, and other uh, other materials are ahead of timber in this uh, case. What you showed also, but um, yeah, is there a guess? Maybe also could be from you or from from the audience. Is there a guess how far we are away um, to reach the flexibility which we have now for concrete? Uh, to reach it also for for timber slabs, so I don't know. Or is it maybe uh, we will never come there? So <laughs> what what what's your guess? Only a guess. Must mustn't be precise. <clears throat> Do you want a a time time frame or more of a? I um maybe it could be both. It could be a time frame, or it could be um if if it's if it's um in general if it's um not possible if it's uh, yeah or it, will it be possible one day i guess we all hope that it would be but but of course i also think just on a personal level that since timber and concrete are inherently totally different material building in exactly the same way should not be possible and maybe we should not achieve to it exactly but just enabling a greater 
variation in timber, maybe even as a first step, achieving um, a greater variety if we build with post and slab rather than post and beam, mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. example, in timber. Because if we think about it, if we think about the needs of housing, but also that we do not want to tear down um, houses that we build, um, if we look at what's being built, it's either panel construction, which of course means tearing down load bearing walls, uh, if it's not thought of in advance of, is it enough flexible? Or it's um, post and beam and tin timber because that's the only way to achieve um, long spans right now. But it's also a question of how big spans do we really need? Mm -hmm. But if, if we manage to kind of um, come more on a flat slab level and have more variety um, in terms of placing our divisions or moving them, I think that would be a big step uh, forward for timber construction, just because when we look at the range of buildings that we have, the spans are quite small. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's still the regulatory things we consider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so far. And uh, are there any other questions regarding to um, the topics to Anna or Alia? Yes, I have a question. Uh, to Alia, uh, yes, uh, concerning this uh, architecture from the 70s, mm -hmm. I saw in the presentation uh, there was one very important topic, uh, it was flexibility, variability, yes, uh, yeah. the architects is so it's very important that the buildings are flexible, variability, and things like that. So now the buildings are, they built, uh, they were built in the 70s. Uh, so they, we know they are in use or they were in use and do we know something about uh, in the reality was there really a flexible use of the buildings were they adapted somewhere or was it possible really to use it change, flexible and are there any is there any research about that yeah, because uh, for me, this this topic flexible, everything has to be flexible. But I, I'm I just I'm asking me myself, do we really flexible use? Yeah, that uh, is a very important question and very uh, important uh, yeah topic. Thank you so much. So as I said, that uh, in the seventies there was beginning of the post occupancy analysis, and as it happens to be, there was actually post occupancy analysis of the buildings of. Biblia von und Klodresse and um, Elementa. It's 440 pages report, five or wait, I think, yeah, five years after the people moved in and questions about how do you use your space? Did you do any smaller interior renovations or changes? Did you do the bigger changes? Uh, how do you estimate how do you feel yourself there? It's a report uh, of all of the different um, places as well, because all of these competitions that were done in different part of the of Germany. So you can also see difference between, for example, Bavaria or Nordrhein-Westfalen, um, but mostly it's West Germany. And um, as I already said, even in our precedents or even in this post occupancy analysis, you see that mostly the opportunity of flexibility was not being used so the there was opportunity of moving the interior walls or doing some changes but it was not used by the occupants by the users so what we looked at the rp10 at the very beginning of our research we looked at the notions or uh understanding of flexibility and adaptability in the very beginning should flexibility be generic being just a generic floor plan that you can do whatever you want or should it be flexibility or adaptability in the way that hannah presented just now of the lcrl or the aim of cluster to do the building system that would be not generic cluster that creating some adaptable spaces, uh, shifting the columns and creating some nonlinear. Uh, 
very interesting question. If you want, I can send you a link. There is this document that I found. Uh, it's from the EFA. Um, and yeah, as I said, there were consultants. Uh, among the consultants, there were also architects of Danish who actually went to the occupants and did this whole uh, evaluation. How do they actually find this flexibly one in Kunduz? Um, but out of my own pers personal perspective, I would say that the experiment stayed experiment because we uh, uh, mostly still live in predefined uh, generic roster layout buildings. I grew up in Russia where panel housing and huge blocks are norm. Uh, and the option of creating your own environment or surrounding is still not very mm. yeah, fair. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe I have something like a note. <laughs> um, uh, yesterday I was remembering um, of a lecture I once um, heard in, when I studied <laughs> from Rudolf Horn. He was a, a furniture designer and architect uh, in the GDR in uh, Eastern Germany. And um, he designed um, furniture. They um, were from the bottom to the up to the ceiling. And his idea was um, that you can create your own uh, ground plan in your apartment with, with this furniture. <laughs> um, because um, every time your life situation changes, you can change your like the number of your rooms you need. Um, and therefore he designed this uh, furniture. And I was wondering, um, yeah, if you considered something like that. <laughs> And um, what I was um, actually going to say is um, that I think this uh, furniture program wasn't that um, successful um, because um, uh, they had some um, uh, Musterwohnungen. Um, uh, some uh, model yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and some people um, used this furniture, but it wasn't that popular in the GDR, unfortunately. Or well, I don't know. I think this idea is um, quite simple and um, somehow genius, but it wasn't that successful. <laughs> the, yeah, that is so, the same that Priyota was talking about in the Adaptable uh, Architecture Symposium that in a way, when we are doing everything very adaptable and generic to everybody the same, that everybody is dealing with the same blocks. And how can you actually, like, where is you? Where is, like, your personal identity in these buildings where there is a huge mass housing of 50,000 people living in there and everybody has the same layout, everybody has the same building blocks for their kitchen or for this uh, furniture. Uh, it is, yeah, I feel that it's very in trend of that idea of socialism back then in the DR where everybody has this standardized kitchen unit, standardized, whatever, I don't know, lifestyle. Um, but that is actually what the architects back then in the 70s were, uh, or even these radical movements they were warning you about. They were saying, hey, we're standardizing everything. We're uh, doing everything economically um, profitable and quick and fast, and at the end, we're actually losing this the identity of the space. Because then you can put this panel block where it's standing in Moscow or it's standing in Rio de Janeiro, and it's it's the same. Sorry, <laughs> for my rent. Yeah. 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 So what, what I wanted to say as well, what we find, mm -hmm. what we uh, this is the, actually the book, Architektur wird bewerbe, if, if somebody wants to read more about the, each uh, submission, so the competitions that I was talking about. Only one submission out of all of them thought about flexibility in vertical dimension. 
So most of them are looking at the flexibility in a way of, hey, I have here a side plan, I have here a normal plan, and we can just expand like more having the spaces of the earth around us. But it's very rare and only one in the last in Integra were thinking about what it is if flexibility would be remove a ceiling of or remove the slab of one space and it will be a double space. Or <laughs> that's it. I just feel that we need that more creative approach or adaptable approach to the building system. This is why uh, Hannah's contribution to in in which way our systems are still that restrictive and still so generic is actually very valuable. Okay, thank you, Alia. Are there any more questions? Maybe also from the audience. Uh, um, yeah. Maybe everyone can now open uh, their cameras and maybe this is like. better for our <laughs> discussion. So if you want to, please feel free. <laughs> and yeah, thank you. <laughs> maybe I have one, um, uh, one more question for, for Alia. Um, you had, I think on slide 11, there was this um, cross where you have the vertical, you had uh, innovation and tradition. Yeah. And, and my question is, um, if it's, um, if it's, if it's right to, uh, to put uh, the tradition always on the opposite of the innovation, because, um, um, at the beginning, I showed this example from structure, um, where they, um, based on this, um, traditional, uh, carpentry connection. They transfer it somehow in, in the future, I would say, or they, they, they made something new out of it. And, uh, I think, um, there are different phases from, from, uh, tradition. And, um, of course, if we see, if we look on tradition as, um, just keeping it like this and never change a running system, then, uh, it would fit. But, uh, if, if, um, tradition also have, I think, uh, the, the, the impact for, uh, giving uh, new ideas for for the future. So maybe yeah, that's not a real question, but <laughs> that's something to to remark on. <clears throat> uh, yeah, if you want, I can share the slide again and to yeah. explain more about it. Uh, this was our joint diagram that we built uh, together in our uh and within the Institute of Architectural History, we we're looking at the tradition mm -hmm. and novelty of. Uh, building systems so that means all the, the building tools so uh brick and mortar will be tradition and i don't know prefabrication would be probably innovation there but it also it only works this diagram not only looking at one axis of tradition to innovation but also looking at standardization and individualization and these four corners that you see this is the aspects which we're looking at, are the building system rigid or not? Cost efficient, are they monotonous? Are uh, they using existing codes and procedures or there's unprecedented codes and building codes and procedures? Are they more demonstrative in a way that they're experimental user oriented? Uh, Prefabricated system for me is innovation because before the 60s, there were generally not that, it's not a brick and mortar. <laughs> it's not something very hands on. Uh, platform based solutions that started their control over the budget and still though limited range of, limited range of options for the upper left corner. So yeah, I understand your, your command. And we talked about it a lot, whether innovation is actually the right word to use it, but it was more in a way of traditional building tools and novel building tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Then any other question? If not, I would hand over to Julia for the last round now. And uh, thanks again for the participants, but um, we are not done now, but soon. <laughs> so, Julia, you had the word. Yeah, 
we prepared something like a general questions first for our speakers and then of course um, for our audience. Um, we were wondering <laughs> um, um, what will be the relationship between social housing and lighthouse projects in the future? Um, will they approach somehow? <laughs> Um, because um, through all of these new developments in construction, like robotics and so on, um, or will it still be a question of standardization and individualization in the future? Um, we would like to ask all of our three speakers um, to give an, um, yeah, a comment <laughs> on, our, uh, on our question. And afterwards, um, yeah, the audience. Um, Alia, do we, uh, Alia, you are still yeah. muted. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask, maybe you can ask this question in German, because I don't think I know said it in English. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, also, wir wollten um, so ein bisschen so eine allgemeine Frage stellen, über die man diskutieren kann, eine offene Frage, um, und die euch, uh, euch drei Rednerinnen am Anfang gerne fragen und danach das gerne auch fürs Publikum öffnen. Um, und zwar haben wir uns gefragt, wie in Zukunft, ähm, in welchem Verhältnis in Zukunft ähm, sozialer Wohnungsbau und Leuchtturmprojekte stehen. Also so. werden die sich annähern? Kann man sagen, dass ähm, sozialer Wohnungsbau in Zukunft nicht so rechteckig aussehen wird, sondern auch freiere Formen mhm. bekommen wird? Ähm, wird es da durch die neuen Möglichkeiten, neue Technologien überhaupt noch diese Unterscheidung wie Leute sozusagen geben können oder ähm, könnten die sich sogar annähern in der Zukunft? Uh, I would start then. <laughs> I'm still unmuted. Uh, so I, I feel my personal impression. If you look at Hannah's part of the presentation of the Mohold building, this is a student house in the uh, Brock house building, it's also student house. And so I think that's something that more social housing will maybe be a platform for experimentation and hopefully that will be the starting point of creating more interest in more lighthouse projects that will create a new building culture that they will inspire of uh inspire new typologies that we use up until now uh that is my my hope at least, but also my hope is that uh, looking back 50 years from now, that also society and politics will be at par with the developments in the building culture and will actually accept and go on with it and invest the money and state will fund. Uh, something that we talked about yesterday in our RP10 meeting that the new uh, update about uh, state uh, is not funding the KfW project anymore, uh, KfW. Um, so would there be some state funded initiatives which will help, help us in a timber market stories to create social housing that will be a, a lighthouse or everything that comes. We need more of that. Okay. Thank Let's you. Let's tell this uh, to the Ministry of Rural Areas <laughs> at the next meeting, Moritz. <laughs> yeah, he's he's gone. He was he was there, but now he's gone. He yeah. knew. <laughs> so um yeah, then maybe maybe Hannah. Do you want to come in? Yeah, I think I I really, in a way, um, like how Alia expressed the um, room for experimentation. I, I think currently maybe timber development is also really influenced by research and development. Um, and I hope that this kind of will manifest not only in terms of technical um, in enhancements for timber construction, 
but also thinking about what the new ways and spaces of living are. So from a more design perspective, so maybe just linking more um, tech, uh, technical development um, with more designers and educating more designers about potentials would be also a way to go. And I hope that that would kind of, I, I don't know, when I, or whenever I think about um, projects that were different, I think a lot of them were also and the conception was as research or in academia, uh, as like a protected bubble where ideas emerge. So maybe that's something that um, really starts happening more and more as research and development gets more um, appreciated in practice. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, yeah, Uber Nopper? You want to join? Oh, pardon, I just was interrupted. I was just interrupted. Okay, Julia, um, willst du Soll ich die Frage noch mal wiederholen? Ja, bitte. Genau. Ähm, also, das war eher so eine offene Frage, so eine Einschätzung. Äh, wollten wir gerne von Ihnen. Ähm, wie, wie wird das in Zukunft das Verhältnis zwischen äh, sozialem Wohnungsbau und Leuchtturmprojekten sein? Also glauben Sie, die könnten sich annähern in Zukunft ähm, durch die neuen Entwicklungen im Bauwesen, dass man auch im sozialen Wohnungsbau zum Beispiel viel freier wird, viel freiere Formen hat, ähm, dass da einfach sozusagen nicht mehr so diese großen Unterschiede sind zwischen ganz platt gesagt jetzt mal der rechte Winkel und der Kasten auf der einen Seite und die freie Form auf der anderen? Also zunächst mal ist es so, dass wir ganz, ganz viele Vorschriften haben für den sozial geförderten Wohnungsbau. Also die muss, da ist genau festgeschrieben, wie die Wohnung eben äh, auszusehen hat oder nicht auszusehen, aber wie viele Quadratmeter das haben dürfte, wie groß die Abstellfläche sein muss, wie groß irgendwelche Nebenflächen sein dürfen. Also ich kenne das nicht alles auswendig, aber da gibt es ganz, ganz viele ähm, Regulare, die Wohnungen dürfen nicht zu klein sein, die dürfen aber auch nicht zu groß sein. Und ähm, insofern, und auf der anderen Seite <lacht> gibt es aber auch gewisse Standards und die Baustandards werden immer höher, auch gerade was so Thema Sicherheit anbelangt, was das Thema Brandschutz ist ja angesprochen worden, anbelangt, was das Thema Außenraumgestaltung äh, anbelangt. Also ähm, das macht eben das Bauen einfach teuer. <lacht> und es ist ja auch bekannt, dass eben durch ganz, ganz viele Vorschriften das Bauen einfach ähm, teurer wird und das ist ein ziemlicher Spagat und im Wohnungsbau ist es so, die Mieten sind dann vorgegeben und ein Investor, der kann sich aus der Miete ausrechnen, wie viel das Projekt kosten darf und damit ist in diesem Bereich schon also da ein richtiger Spagat da. Also dieses ganz freie Entwerfen und Leuchtturmprojekte, das ist so schon also das sehe ich schon, also weiß ich jetzt nicht, ob das so zusammenkommen wird. In diesem Fall jetzt zum Beispiel bei unserem Projekt ist es halt so, dass wir sehr, sehr viele relativ kleine Wohnungen haben, viele. Ja, und äh, damit ist natürlich die Miete pro Quadratmeter etwas höher. Ja, es ist trotzdem vielleicht noch eine günstige Wohnung in der Summe im absoluten Wert. Ja, aber äh, das hat es eben auch ermöglicht, da äh, etwas, äh, ja, sowas zu realisieren. Ja. Und dann gab es auch noch Zuschüsse und, und so weiter, Förderungen. Also ich kenne jetzt die ganze gesamte Finanzierungsstruktur, kenne ich nicht. Also das hat auf jeden Fall dieses Projekt in dieser Form ermöglicht. Aber in der Breite ist es schon schwierig. Und natürlich haben unsere Bauherren haben einfach dieses Problem. Ich sage jetzt einmal Stichwort KfW 55 ist ja jetzt gestoppt. Gut, irgendwo verständlich. Klar, das ist inzwischen Baustandard, aber das war ein Zuschuss. Mit dem hat man kalkuliert. Und der ist jetzt weg. Jetzt muss man natürlich auf KfW 40 oder äh, gehen. Der ist aber wieder teurer. Ja, also wie gesagt, also unsere, unsere Projekte, das, was wir machen, das ist immer irgendwo an der Kante. Ja, also in der Wirtschaftlichkeit. Ja, weil wir auch, und dann haben wir natürlich noch ein ökologisches Produkt. Ja, und das ist halt teurer wie ein Wärmedämmverbundsystem. Und ein Holzfenster ist halt auch teurer als ein Kunststofffenster und ein Linoleum teurer als ein PVC und, und, und. Ja. Und also diesen Spagat, das ist eigentlich so das, was wir tagtäglich erleben und auch wirklich kämpfen müssen, um 
Projekte, aber wir haben auch viele Kunden, die wirklich das schätzen und auch versuchen und das auch möchten, auch was ändern möchten. Also Und äh, deswegen sind wir auch da durchaus auch erfolgreich. Aber erst im Wohnungsbau, im klassischen Wohnungsbau, wo sie wirklich diese Miete haben und aus der Miete sich dann den Ertrag rechnen und dann die Investition dagegen setzen müssen, ja, da können sie, da, dem sind dann irgendwo Grenzen gesetzt, irgendwo, ne? also dem Investitionsbudget. Das war jetzt schon eine ganze Menge, okay. also die, die, alltägliche, äh, die alltägliche Herausforderung ja, zwischen ja. schön bauen oder auch ökologisch bauen und aber auch ganz klar, äh, sagen wir, diesen, diesem, ja, unterworfen zu sein. Aber auf, ich finde es auf der anderen Seite auch spannend, ja, weil ich denke, auch gerade in diesen Bereichen soll ja auch was Ansprechendes und auch was Ökologisches auch realisiert werden können. Das ist die Herausforderung. Okay, danke schön. Jetzt haben wir eine Wortmeldung aus dem Publikum. Ähm, Benny Eisele. Ja, danke schön. Ähm, ich denke, an der Stelle ist es eben die Frage, wie man Leuchtturmprojekt definiert. Also ein Leuchtturmprojekt kann ein Projekt sein, das durch eine herausragende architektonische Gestaltung und Freiform sich definiert. Aber für mich wäre jetzt ein Leuchtturmprojekt eher ein Projekt, das, ich sage mal, auf allen Ebenen punktet. Und da gehört eben auch die Kosteneffizienz dazu, da gehört die Materialeffizienz dazu und da gehört auch die Energieeffizienz dazu. Und dementsprechend, wenn man das eben schafft, alle Punkte ähm, souverän zu lösen, sprich ein Gebäude, das funktional ist, das mit sehr wenig Materialeinsatz zurechtkommt, das vielleicht demontierbar ist, das man wiederverwerten kann dann, ähm, und das gleichzeitig auch noch günstig ist, dann wäre das für mich ein, ein Leuchtturmprojekt. Und dann spricht da auch nichts dagegen, dass man das eben im sozialen Wohnungsbau einsetzt, weil es eben auch Kosteneffizienz neben allen anderen Faktoren ist. Das heißt, das wäre so eine Art äh, Kommunikationsaufgabe, ähm, auch das, was nicht offensichtlich äh, ins Auge springt durch eine besondere Form, als was Besonderes eben darzustellen oder sagen wir mal, ähm, das, was nicht offensichtlich auf dem Foto rüberkommt, kommunikativ zu vermitteln. Richtig, genau. Das sind eben, natürlich sieht man die Gestaltung als erstes, aber viele andere Bereiche, in denen eben so ein Gebäude auch punkten kann, sieht man nicht als erstes und absolut richtig, das wäre dann eben Aufgabe der Kommunikation, eben die Punkte auch darzustellen. Mhm. Okay, danke. Dann noch weitere Beiträge? Aus dem Publikum. Wir sind ja auch schon wieder weit fortgeschritten. Von daher ähm, danke nochmal an alle Teilenden, an, an die Vortragenden. Und äh, ja, then we will come to the last final round. Um, Yeah, that would be just um, before we go home, a question. Maybe every uh, participant or for every uh, presenter can ask um, the other person what would uh, he like to take from him. So, Alia, you can decide, for example, if you want to dir eine Scheibe abschneiden von Hannah or Herr Nopper. And if you do that, um, what would you take? What did, would you take home now from this day to, to improve or, or uh, take with you? And then you can hand over to Anna and Anoka. But you mean that not literally cutting off stuff of other people? <laughs> no, I don't understand. Scheibe abschneiden, not literally cutting. Oh, ich verstehe sie, glaube ich, nicht. Just what you take away from, uh, from yeah. the other speakers. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, ja. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Some German expressions I still need to learn. Ja, um, yeah, Hannover, I think I would take away home the idea of that active house or building with three zeros is actually a real opportunity, not even opportunity, it's reality. Mm -hmm. And we're so much past the visions for the future. As uh, somebody said, if we want to 
achieve our goals and by 2050 we need to start acting now so start building now uh, and yeah this is what my impression of making the passive house or active house is a reality thank you Ich bin immer wieder fasziniert, wenn ich sehe, I'm always fascinated if I see what, what, um, yes, but in other um, parts of the world or in Scandinavian countries or even in Germany, wherever, um, the possibilities uh, that, um, yes, Hannah showed us, yes, uh, this interesting architecture. I think it's fa fascinating, yes, what is possible and also the creativity of human, um, yes. This is not not everything is everywhere possible, yes. Uh, but it's I think it's important that that we can see what is possible, and so uh, this was uh, and very interesting for me. Thank you, Hanna. Yeah. Um, well, first, thank you guys for organizing this. I think all together it was really nice to hear the uh, three lectures. And also just to uh, see and kind of go through the steps of um, the design and considerations that you presented today um, for the Steve House was really interesting. I think what um, kind of maybe in discussion came out was how historically, although technologies have gone further, we've changed our materials, but this issue of flexibility and unanswered questions on how to improve the way we lived are still unanswered. So I'm kind of interested in how future shaping or thoughts about this evolve. Because I think whenever we're talking about housing or modular construction, this always kind of seems to be a big um, topic. So I think it was very interesting to see historical overview and also thoughts from um, someone and how they predicted um, 2020. I think that's I don't know, just crazy to see sometimes. <laughs> okay, yeah, then thank you all for coming and um, joining and um, being with us. And I think for me, it was uh, interesting too. And, um, but we don't want to, uh, yeah, let it run too, too long. So, so I think it's, we are right on time. I um, was wondering uh, if, if we um, match this today, but um, yeah, thanks again for joining and um, having you here and have a good evening and um, see you next time. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Danke auch für die Vorträge und ähm, wir sind auch gerne offen für Feedback, also genau. im Nachhinein und immer wir, gerne. Wir auch nochmal auf den einen oder anderen zurück hier. Na, ja. ansonsten bis zum nächsten Mal. Dankeschön ja. und tschüss. Danke. Danke. Schön. Vielen Dank. Tschüss. Schönes Wochenende. Bye. Bye.